Okay, well, it's four o'clock on the dot, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we have a, a great group of people here. That's wonderful. Um, I'm Cheryl Jenkins. I'm the president-elect of the Horned Lizard Conservation Society, uh, and I'm also one of the Southern California Society representatives. I live in San Diego County, California. Um, so I am excited that we're gonna be talking about California species today. So um, our presenter is Dr. Cameron Barrows, who's um, a conservation biologist from the city of California, Riverside. Um, he's worked as a research scientist in conservation for the past 17 years and is currently retired. Um, his focus has been on understanding how desert species are responding to ethnogenetic change and primarily climate change, <clears throat> excuse me, which is a very big topic these days. Uh, classes that he has taught and still teaches are California Desert Naturalist, Climate Stewardship, and um, those are both through the University of California Cooperative Extension Program. The presentation today is going to be um, about the status of three horned lizard species at the junction of the Mojave and Colorado deserts in California. And um, I will go ahead and let him take over because he can talk about all of that more than, you know, better than I can. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Barros, for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to see some folks that I've met along the way and, and be in a um, audience of people that are as passionate about horned lizards as I am. So I am, let's see here. Um, Let me just uh, add real quick. Um, if anyone has questions, please um, post them in the chat and we will get to them after. And then we'll also have time for an open uh, question and answer uh, session after the presentation. All right, first, my screen is not opening up here, so I'm going to stop for a second and start over again and make see if I can make it happen this time. All right, there we go. Okay, welcome again. And as build, I'm going to be talking about the three horned lizards that occur in California and talk about some of the issues and problems they face with a lot of focus on the flat tailed horned lizard, but we're going to talk about all of them along the way. The first one I'm just going to introduce it are the desert horned lizards. And um, the amazing thing about them is that they're doing well in the face of a lot of different things that are happening in the desert right now. But they're also one of the most variable of the horned lizards in terms of their ability to match the color that of the landscape in which they live. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that they're changing their color individually. It just means that they, if they don't match their environment, they get eaten. So those that match well do very well. And you can see how well they do match individual habitats along the way. They occur. A, uh, appropriately with their names uh, uh, only in the deserts. And so the deserts throughout um, California, as well as into Nevada, um, Arizona, and parts of Utah. So this is a real, a true desert species. The other species, one of the other species we're gonna, I'm going to talk about are what used to be for referred to as the coast horn lizard. And it used to be considered one species that occurred all the way from um, Central California down to the tip of Baja, but Adam Lachey, who I saw his here, did some really good work with the genetics and, and took those and separated into four different species. So we're going to just talk about the most northern of those four, which is the um, Blainville's horned lizard. They also do a little bit of color matching. Um, again, not that they're matching individually as they move through the landscape, but because that they are evolved to avoid predation as best as they can in those habitats where they occur. So whether it's red areas or white areas, gray areas, they seem to match that fairly well. But in both cases with the 
desert horned lizard and the um, Blainville's horned lizard. It indicates that there is a fair amount of um, predation by visual predators, probably mostly birds. And that's the best way that they can avoid that. Um, the Blainville's horned lizard, as you can see in the map, is more coastally distributed. Um, this is the one species when I talk to people about horned lizards, if they grew up in California, they're constantly telling me, well, where did all the horned lizards go? Because as a child, when they grew up, they used to see them on their hikes and excursions through the countryside, and now they're not seeing them anymore. Well, to a large extent, they're not seeing any anymore because now there's houses there. But the other problem is that they, um, as with all horned lizards, they primarily, primarily are eating ants. And in these more coastal habitats and in habitats that are irrigated in any way or shape or form, the ants, the native ants, the native harvester ants have been replaced by both Argentine ants and fire ants. And using um, captive populations that they, the Blainfield's horned lizard cannot survive on either of those two species. They just, they don't eat them or they, they don't, they lose weight and they eventually die. Um, they need the harvester ants and the harvester ants are displaced by the encroaching um, Argentine and fire ants. So that's what we, what's going on there. And then the one, like I said, I'll probably spend the most time with is the flat-tailed horned lizard. This is a species that at least in within the United States has the smallest distribution of any of the horned lizards. Um, it, it, it has the narrowest habitat um, selection and it arguably is the most endangered. It has been proposed to be listed as threatened and, or endangered by both the state of California and the federal government probably half a dozen times at this point and each time it's been rejected. Um, a lot of us biologists shake our heads and, and wonder as to why they've been rejected both times. But um, here they are. I mean, they have the longest horns of any horn, horned lizard in um, North America or any horned lizard anywhere. Cause, um, and they do use those. When I, when I was first learning to handle them and I put my hand on their back, um, they'd arch their back and, and stab me and I draw blood pretty readily. Um, one of their field marks everybody uses is this dark line down the back. They're the horn, only horned lizard with a dark line down, down the back. But if you can see in this upper photo up here, they don't always have that. that. That actually is the only one I've ever found that didn't have it. But the fact that, that they exist without them means that at least occasionally they don't. Um, they do a little bit of color matching um, in the browner sands. They have sort of this tan body in the more pale sands in the Coachella Valley. They tend to be more gray. So um, just to show you, this is their probably historic distribution. Right in the center of here is the Salton Sea, which was there periodically. Um, but otherwise, they this was their range. They um, basically the Colorado desert um, or the southern part of the Colorado desert. Um, today, and this is probably much larger um, estimation of their current distribution. Um, they're fragmented populations, mostly by agriculture, um, housing developments up here in the Coachella Valley. There's only one population left, which is right underneath the O and Joshua tree right there. Um, they do occur into Mexico in a couple of places. The polygons that I've drawn here, drawn here are much broader than the, their actual distribution because they tend not to occur as much on active big dunes. And a lot of these areas are active big dunes, but more around the periphery of dunes or in more silty habitats. The, the only thing that really gets them uh, change where the habitat changes is when you start getting into gravel and rocks and that's where the desert horned lizard takes over. So here's a, a picture of their habitat and the active dune over here is where you find Coachella Valley fringe total lizards or other species of fringe total lizards depending on what dune you're um, on. But this area down here where you have this silty um, almost clay habitat with it, in this case a veneer of blow sand over the top of it is their ideal habitat. 
of those three species, this is by far the easiest one to find in this habitat because they leave tracks. And the tracks are very distinctive. They're easy to find or easy to locate. Once you find a track, you just follow the track and, and you'll find either their burrow or the lizard at the end. I was just out on the, their habitat here in the Coachella Valley last week with a group of um, volunteers and naturalists that wanted to see them. And we almost couldn't take more. Once we got into the heart of their habitat, it was very difficult to move forward because there was tracks everywhere. We would, I'd stop it, make everybody stop. And so we wouldn't, nobody would step on them. And we, and I just sort of visually follow each track and we'd find lizard after lizard after lizard. In this case, this time of year, we're seeing the hatchlings um, from last fall. And they're typically about an inch long at this point. But again, relatively easy to find compared to other horned lizards. This is my cartoon of the Coachella Valley where I do most of the research I am. I've, work in here. And, and this bump over here is Joshua Tree National Park. Here's the bottom of the Coachella Valley. And, and this is the top um, of the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains. And this is over 3,000 meters. Um, here in the um, Joshua Tree, it's um, quite a bit lower than that. And then the, the Coachella Valley floor is at about sea level or a little bit less in some cases. So the flat-tailed horned lizard is only on the valley floor, or at least used to be but only on the valley floor. It used to occur throughout the entire Coachella Valley on the floor. Um, it is now re restricted to just one parcel, which is probably about 2,000 acres of habitat. Otherwise, everything else has been developed, or in one way or another, the habitat is no longer suitable. Um, the next one up the slope are the desert horned lizards. They occur much higher in Joshua Tree than they do over here in the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains. Um, and there was a period of time, a very short period of time, where they overlapped slightly with um, the flat-tailed horned lizards. There was a habitat near the west end of the valley that had a mixture of sand and gravel and rocks and blow sand and both species occurred in that habitat, but eventually um, the flat tails um, were extirpated from that site. There still are occasional desert horned lizards there, but that's um, otherwise the flat tails are only found in just one part parcel. And then the Blainville's horned lizard, at least in the desert areas, is a high elevation species. They occur in a very small elevation range within Joshua Tree National Park, used to be much larger and a, a fairly broad range in the San Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains, mostly in chaparral or high desert habitats. Um, so in our desert, we have a lot of um, potential challenges for conserving horned lizards of all species, one of which is that people tend to regard, or many people tend to regard the deserts as lifeless and there's not, nothing out there, so let's go have fun on our um, dune buggies and motorcycles and quad runners and so forth. And this is an ongoing problem um, throughout the Coachella Valley and throughout all our desert areas. There are, of course, designated areas where they occur. There is even um, an area within the Anza Borrego Desert State Park, the Ocotillo Wells area, that has both flat tails and um, off-road vehicle use. And the flat tails are being monitored on a regular basis. And the, as far as I know, they seem to be sustaining their population, but they, most of the surveys, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, are peripheral to the main area where the off-road vehicles are using the habitat. There's also energy development, uh, lots and lots of energy development going on in the desert right now. It's kind of a gold rush and, um, a lot of this is happening in habitat that is either um, currently occupied by flat-tailed horned lizards or um, desert horned lizards. As they, um, the, fortunately for the desert horned lizards, there's a, they have a much broader range, but for the flat-tailed horned lizards, they have a much smaller range, as I've said before. And then, of course, there's the border wall, and um, the border wall is perhaps one of the reasons that the that and the energy development probably perhaps arguably, and I don't wanna step on anybody's political toes here, but one of the reasons that the species has never 
reached a higher protection status both in the state and federal government. Um, but all of this was at one time, this is Mexico on this side, this is the US, California on that side. And, and on both sides, this would have been flat-tailed habitat at one point, um, but of course not right now. So this one parcel in the Coachella Valley, as I said, it's only about a couple of thousand acres of habitat. It is the part owned in part by the state of California and part by the federal government. It's the Coachella Valley National Wildlife Refuge. That's the federal government part and the Coachella Valley um, Ecological Reserve, which is the state habitat. Um, the state is really just a small section right down here. And the rest of this is the National Wildlife Refuge. With such a small area, we wanted to learn as much as we could about this habitat, find out exactly how the, horn, the flat-tailed horned lizards were doing within this area, and what are the factors that might um, keep them from being able to continue to thrive in this habitat. Um, they used to be on all of these small patches here. They are no longer there. All of these dark areas you see here are golf courses, um, which at least during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and early 2000s was the gold rush here in the Coachella Valley. Um, they stopped building them. Um, they've, they've actually overbuilt them. There's, there's more golf courses and they're all are golfers at this point. And the golf courses use, at least in the summertime, about a million gallons of water per day per golf course. Um, and then, in a desert that there's there's so many things that are is wrong with that. Um, and of course they take up a lot of habitat. There is interesting some effort to take some of these golf courses and restore them back to natural habitat, or at least something that produces habitat for um, native species. And, and we're encouraging that effort to go on. But as you said, or as I said, this is everything that looks dark in here is a golf course. Um, so one of our questions going into this was, in such a small area, is there an edge effect? Um, we, we, we can imagine that there's an edge effect of blow sand coming through this area and blowing out onto other people's habit, um, property, but is there a reverse impact where the people are and their, the way they manage their lands having an impact on the animals and plants that are protected within the refuge, and in particularly both the fringe toad lizard, which is, is a listed species, and the flat-tailed horned lizard. Again, this is the only um, population left north of the Salton Sea, and, and you really have to get down to places within Joshua Tree or down um, more further south before you find healthy populations of them elsewhere. So one of the questions we had was, was, was there an edge effect? And so we measured their habitat along the edge and measured their abundance in the, along the edge. And what we found was ants were abundant along the edge, fringe toad lizards were abundant along the edge, um, all the rodents that live out there were abundant along the edge, but flat-tailed lizard, horned lizards weren't. And you can see um, on this graph right here that you had to get at least over 100 meters. And, and these the two different colors here are two different years where we measured them. And I, I did the same thing this year. I didn't include it in the graph. And the same gap occurs here. So within about the first 100 meters and arguably the 150 meters, there are fewer horned lizards than you would expect. But once you get beyond 150 meters, they, the populations seem to be doing just fine. So this was puzzling. If fringe toad lizards were doing fine over here and all the other animals that live in the Coachella Valley sand dune system are doing fine, what was why were the horned lizards doing so poorly as you get to the edge? And to try to get to that answer, um, I put a, I grabbed or captured about a half a dozen of them and put radios on their back to see why they were avoiding that area. And for, within a week, when I went back to, to find all the lizards, all of the re radioed lizards were gone, every single one of them. And it was, I, I couldn't imagine that all the lizards or all the radios would have failed. And so I hiked you know, miles into the, the middle of the refuge trying to find them and couldn't find them. And, and it was very frustrating. I just couldn't imagine what was going on here. 
But one day in frustration as I was looking for them, couldn't find them, I forgot to turn off the radio receiver and I was driving home. And when I got to this point, all of the, the radio just started beeping all, on all frequencies, every frequency I, I checked, they were um, beeping like crazy. So I got out, pulled out the antenna and walked across the street trying to figure out where they were. And it turned out all the radios were in the top of that palm tree right there. <laughs> so as you all know, horned lizards don't climb trees and certainly flat-tailed horned lizards don't climb trees, but birds of prey do nest in these trees. Um, so in typical horned lizard habitat and typical um, flat-tailed horned lizard habitat, there's no shrubs or trees that are substantial enough to be a nest site for any of the potential predators that would, um, avian predators that would impact and prey on um, horned lizards, but in this case, a, an American crest, kestrel, which of course is a native species, but would never um, live on the valley floor because no nesting sites. But the kestrels are doing quite well because in the Coachella Valley, people plant a lot of palm trees and they can nest in the tops of those palm trees. There's a little shelf where the um, leaf petiole hits the trunk that is a perfect nesting site for them. So um, we identified that this was the problem, that these kestrels were nesting in this golf course area, but there wasn't anything to, for them to eat. So they were flying over to the um, refuge and sitting on the power lines along the edge of the refuge. And they would sit there and stare at the ground, waiting for a horned lizard to move. And this, then they would fly right towards them and prey on them and pull them, take them back to the, this um, tree to uh, feed their babies. So I get a question a lot, why wouldn't they do the same thing to the fringe toed lizards, which occur in the same habitat or very similar nearby habitats. And the only reason that I can come up with is that when you encounter a, a fringe toed lizard, they do two things. They either dive in the sand and bury themselves very deeply, or they run like hell and they run really fast they're the fastest organism out on the dunes and so if they see a shadow or a shape coming towards them they do one of those two things and birds can be quite intelligent one of the things they haven't really seemed to solve is when a, a, a prey item buries itself in the sand they don't seem to be able to acknowledge that all they have to do is dig a little bit and get them out so the um fringed lizards they're anti-predator adaptations seem to work really well in terms of avoiding predation from either kestrels or um, roadrunners or shrikes or anything like that. The opposite is true for the horned lizards. When the horned lizards see something, they typically freeze and it makes, they're just easy pickings for these birds to come in and take them out. And so we have suggested to the refuge folks that they should suggest to the um, palm um, Sun City folks that they should get rid of their palm trees and that's sort of a non-starter. But one of the things that they could do, because every year they trim their palm trees and if they trimmed them just prior to the nesting season for those birds of prey, then the birds of prey would go someplace else. Um, but the Sun City folks have not been willing to do that. So that we figured this out probably about 15 years ago and um, the Kestrels still live there and they are still picking off the, the horned lizards. This was a paper we published a while back. So you all know where the horned lizards in um, North America occur. Of course, that's the only place they occur. They only occur in the driest, um, in, in many cases, the warmest areas of North America. And as a result, um, there is concern on my part and on I think a lot of people's part is what does climate change portend for these species? And so um, we live in the, the red being the hottest area, the, 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 the darkest red areas, except for the Death Valley area, area here and as you jump over into Arizona, but these darkest red areas down here and down into Mexico, that's the habitat of the flat-tailed horned lizard. So, they live in the hottest, driest places in North America. And if it's gonna get hotter and drier, what does that mean to their populations? Well, one of the things that we found was that, well, this is, I'm sorry, this slide is out 
um, a little bit out of sequence here, but this is temperatures. And you can see that in the Coachella Valley, in the heart of the habitat or the historic habitat of the flat-tailed horned lizard, temperatures were pretty consistent until about 1980. And then all of a sudden they just started getting very erratic, but erratic in a warming sense. And so we went from something a little bit less than 23 degrees centigrade as our annual mean temperature to um, something in excess of 25 degrees centigrade at this point is, is what we're dealing with. So we've in, exceeded two degrees centigrade in, in terms of what's happening in terms of climate change. And that is an issue, um, and it's, a, it's an important issue. But the other part of climate change is it's getting drier in our deserts. So this is a um, graph. It's called a standard precipitation index. And everything, every bar that goes below the center line is a drier than average year. Every bar that goes above the center line is a wetter than average year. And, and the the folks that had developed this said that anything in excess of negative two below that line, and these are standard deviations below the line, um, is considered a extreme drought. Um, and you can see that since the early 1920s and the mid 1920s up until the year 2000, there was really just two extreme droughts. Since then, there have been three and um, this year is shaping up to be another one. So four um, in just the last 20 years. And, and so this trajectory seems to be increasing. So what does that mean to the flat-tailed horn lizard? The last 20 years, um, this is a paper that just came out last week, actually, that the last 22-year period is the driest period in the desert southwest since the year 800 or um, about 1,200 years ago. And, it, and it's now exceeding the late 1500s mega droughts. So this is um, unprecedented in terms of what the animals and plants that live in this area are being subjected to. And, and so I, th I think it's worth definitely worth asking the question of what are these species or how are these species able to tolerate or if they're able to tolerate these changes. But if you look at this, this is these are the abundance, this is the abundance of flat-tailed horned lizards on that refuge that I showed you before. And then from year to year, the numbers go up and down, but there's no trajectory here. Even in the last 22 years where we've had the, this mega drought, the um, populations are not going in a consistent up or down direction. In fact, some of the largest um, population levels have been in the middle of one of some of the severe drought, like 2015 and 2016 were uh, amongst the driest years that we've had. And 2021 was also one of the driest years we've had. So this species amazingly seems to be able to deal with what we're um, throwing at them in terms of climate change, at least so far. And, uh, and climate change is going to get much worse. One of the things I have noticed in, in tracking them is that they are spending much more time in their burrows than they were before. And I think this is how they're avoiding the worst of the um, heat of the day. Um, just 10 or 15 years ago when I was out and would track them, uh, I could still find them on the surface in, in the middle of the day. Um, now by nine in the morning, they are down in their burrows and, and they're staying there until probably the late evening and or the next morning. They do get up much earlier than they did before. I, I've been out there at dawn and found their tracks all over, fresh tracks all over the dunes. So they were out there before I was. And um, so they seem to be changing their behavior, um, changing the way their, their activity level um, is. And, and, and in doing that, they're avoiding the heat. Fortunately for them, so are the ants. And so they, they don't seem to have any trouble finding the number of ants that they need. Um, as you can see, the population, some of the highest populations we've seen have been in the last you know, decade or so. So um, climate change doesn't seem to be a problem for them, but I wanted to check some other things. And so this is what the part of their habitat would look like in, in a good year. There's a, a couple of invasive species here, like the tumbleweeds, the Russian thistle, but that doesn't, um, if anything, the Russian thistle is actually benefiting them. When I am searching for them 
um, they'll hide underneath there and nobody's going to get them out when they're down there. Um, so the horned lizard's population does fine with um, Russian thistle, at least at, at the densities that we're seeing here. But when we have it a particularly wet year, and especially if the wet year is um, starts in November or December, where the rains are starting, then the ch desert changes dramatically. And this is what it looks like. This is um, Sahara mustard. And Sahara mustard just covers the entire surface of the, the flat tail horned lizard's habitat. Um, and those years where the the low, lowest population levels that we found, they that coincide with these high levels of Sahara mustard density. So I had somebody, I gave a preliminary talk to this, and somebody said, well, how do you know that the horned lizards numbers are down? It's just, you can't find them. And it's a valid question. Although before we do the surveys, we go out there and take out all of the um, mustard within the transects. And so, because the our survey method depends on our ability to track them. So we have to be able to clear all of the mustard out so that the sand is visible and so we can see the tracks. And so um, I think that the number, the, the the lower numbers in years where there's Sahara mustard is the real numbers. It's, it's not just because they're harder to find during that period. But it, do, it does open up this question is, so why would that be? Why would they, um, the numbers drop so dramatically just because the um, mustard is there? And so this was something we wanted to probe just a little bit further. Um, we did the statistics that we should have to do or <laughs> that we do do. And you can see that I'm comparing this to the fringe tone lizard um, and on those active dunes and looking at the various things that might impact them. And one of which, of course, is rainfall. And you would expect that a desert animal should respond positively to rainfall. And the fringe tone lizards do. When there's more rainfall, they, they, their numbers go up. So both in terms of a positive correlation and, and a, a significant correlation. Um, the, on the active dunes, their mustard isn't as much or as dense, and they don't seem to have a negative or positive relationship to it, and don't seem to have a positive or negative relationship to harvester ants, which um, the fringe toad lizards eat, um, especially in the summertime, that's their primary food. Flat-tailed horn lizards, a very different picture. They, no relationship to rainfall at all, but a very strong relationship to, and it's a negative relationship, ne negative correlation to the Sahara mustard. So again, this underlines what we're observing in the field, but question is why? So one of the questions um, we've been throwing around is, well, how are ants responding to the mustard? And we see the um, harvester ant workers carrying mustard seeds. And so the assumption is that they are eating the seeds. We've also seen um, the harvester ant um, workers up in the green mustard and stripping the green um, seeds out of this, the pods or the silks of the, the mustard. So we know that the harvester ants, at least the workers, think that this is good food. But we wanted to test it a little bit further. So we set up a small experiment, and this is a very preliminary. Nobody, um, we haven't shown this to anybody yet, but I think there might be something here. I'm, I'm hoping some graduate student will see this presentation and get really excited about pursuing this. So what we did is we found queens that had not yet um, established colonies, queen harvester ants, and these are Pagana myrmix, uh, Californica, the species, and we, um, made these ant farms in her ant habitats, put the same sand that they would find in the habitat that where the horned lizards are, and fed them in those little containers that are off to the side. So for half of them, we fed them only mustard seeds. That's the only thing they got. And for the other half, they were only fed not mustard seeds. In fact, only native seeds that we collected um, from the same habitat. And so what we found um, was that for the ant call, the queens that were only fed harvester ants, they never produced brood uh, or successfully produced brood. They never were able to rear any brood and they died within a couple of months, uh, usually less than that. Um, 
but for those that were fed native seeds, they produce brood, the uh, queens continue to live for many, many months afterwards. Um, and so it appears that for reasons that we don't know for sure, whether it's because the seeds are too hard, they, it tastes like food, it smells like food, but it's too hard to, to turn into food for an ant, that might be one reason. Another reason is that they could be toxic, um, even though it smells and tastes like food, it, there may be some toxicity there. Don't know the right answer to that other than to say our preliminary data indicates that, that when there's mustard, the ant population, the populations seem to go down, or at least the new colonies are not being established. And so we think this is a big part of it, um, but there's more research to be done there. And I hope somebody grabs this and, and runs with it because I think this is gonna be a really important part of the overall story for what's going on with um, horned lizards especially the flat tail horned lizards. So I wanted just to um, wrap up with a few other things, talking about the desert horned lizards. There, I don't do this much anymore, but I used to get very interested in modeling. It seemed like this very interesting tool to use. Um, I'm mostly a field biologist um, and I found the modeling really exciting. And then I realized that the models are typically not very, not accurate and that it's very difficult to to test how accurate they are. You can statistically test it, but you're really just testing the same data that you use to create the models. And so it's really not a, a, an accurate test. But this is the border of Joshua Tree National Park. And then this is the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto National Monument down here in the Coachella Valley in the Salton Sea. And anything that green is green is where the model thought would be appropriate um, desert horned lizard habitat as of about 10 years ago when I did this model. Um, and then I, when you do a model like this, the fun, fun thing, I guess fun is relative term, but you can, if one of the variables is climate, you can change that variable and say, where does the good habitat go once you change that variable to something that would be more similar to what we expect climate change is going to do. And so what we did, um, so the red areas are where the, the future habitat should be based on a climate change model. And if it's pink, it means it's new habitat. If it's sort of this brownish um, color, that means that it overlaps with the existing habitat. So they're already where they need to be. Um, so you can see there's this new habitat that's forming and not a, unsurprisingly, it's at higher elevations and, and especially in this Western portion of the Mojave Desert and, and down here, here in the Coachella Valley as well. The interesting thing is, is that where we're finding the highest densities of desert horn lizards is not where the model said they used to be, it's, it is where they, the model said they're going to be. And, and in these areas, this is where the highest densities by far. Um, we, we go out and survey these areas and it's not at all uncommon for us to see you know, three, four, five, up to a half a dozen horned lizards in just one walk through the habitat, which again, we're not able to track them like we are with the um, flat-tailed horned lizards. So it's much more challenging to find them, but we're finding really high densities in these types of habitats. Um, for the Blainfield's horned lizard, we did the same thing. Again, this was a model from about 10 years ago, and you can see that in Joshua tree, they occur only in these high elevations and that's where they were found. And this is a pretty accurate model, but when you do the climate shift, they don't occur in Joshua tree at all anymore. Um, they're completely extirpated from Joshua tree and, and really moving up the mountain towards Big Bear in this case, or up in the higher elevations of the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto mountains. So, the challenge in terms of testing a model like this is you need to have real data and you need to have data that goes that is before climate change happened and after climate change has happened and that is usually not available um, but I was uh, I did my master's degree at Long Beach State uh, back in the day before I found how much fun studying horn lizards were I was I did my master's work on spotted owls and after I finished that and, and worked for a few years with the Nature Conservancy setting up preserves throughout California and then ultimately went back and got my PhD at UC Riverside, 
um, I got a call about five years ago, five or six years ago from uh, one of the alumni at Long Beach State. And they said, we're cleaning out the basement and we've got this box that says Joshua Tree on it. And it's filled with data cards. And they said, do you want it? I said, well, probably what, what's in there? And he said, well, we're looking through them and, and it's a bunch of records of, of reptiles in Joshua Tree National Park from the 1950s and 60s. But yes, I definitely want that. And so they shipped it out to me and, and I, we went through and digitized these each location. And so in this case, they were, you know, this is before GPS. And so they were tell, um, giving on this card the exact location that they could based on mileage from road intersections or the edge of the um, national park. And so I was able to trace pretty close to where they thought they were and then calculate where they found both desert horned lizards and Plainville's horned lizards and then look at then where we find them today. And so I compared the today's, the historic meaning the 1950s, 60s data to iNaturalist data um, and just to see how that changed over time. And so that's what this graph is right here. So the white bars are that is that historic data set though that's from the Long Beach State. And these were students, um, there was um, field trips that the professors used to take them out to Joshua Tree and spend three or four days camping in Joshua Tree. And they would record everything they found on these data cards. Um, so we were, so you can see that for the desert horn lizards, if you look at the elevation right here, the, the, the dominant uh, or the most abundant areas that they found them was basically up to about 1,000 or 1,100 meters. Um, the black is iNaturalist records for the last 10 years, just to say, okay, now where are, are they being found? And you can see there's a, a fairly substantial shift going to these higher elevations now up around 12, 13, 1400 meters. And I act, I'm not on with the iNaturalist, but on my own, I've found them up around 1600 meters as well. So there, there's this active shift and they are moving into habitats that they never were, or at least never were being found before um, in, at the highest elevations within Joshua Tree National Park. Now for Blainvilles, they were always at the top of the habitat. And, but you can see there still is a shift going on. The interesting thing here to me is that these got, the desert horn lizards are now moving into this habitat that historically was occupied by Blainvilles. The folks that um, study these guys and have studied them for years and years and years have told me over and over again that you never find these two species in the same place. So whether or not the Blainville's horn lizard are responding strictly to climate change or whether they're responding to maybe a more aggressive desert horn lizard that is moving into their habitat, I can't say for sure, but the desert horn lizards are moving into what used to be Blainville's um, habitat and the Blainville's in Joshua Tree have nowhere to go. And so it's very likely that that model that I showed you of them being essentially being pushed off the mountain is going to be accurate unless we um, get a handle on climate change pretty quickly. Um, wanted to look at this. So this was using other people's data. This was looking at first the Long Beach State data, the white bars and comparing that to iNaturalist data. Um, what I wanted to do is use data that I was collecting along with um, community scientists or um, citizen scientists that are out there helping me with volunteers. And this is a graph showing that for the desert horn lizard, the only place that we found Blainvilles was at the highest elevation. So there was no shift there to, to be really to notice. But since 2014 and 2019, and this continues to this day, you can see that the same sort of shift that iNaturalist compared to Long Beach State data is showing up here that the um, higher elevation like these white bars, um, just in, in a relatively small amount of time, we're seeing them move into higher and higher elevations. As you can see here, um, the white bars um, and the dark bars are both fairly high elevations. We're not seeing them yet in this black area, which is really the only place left that the Blainvilles have, but otherwise they're shifting their um, population densities to higher and higher elevations and avoiding the smaller, uh, the lower elevation. So you can see, for instance, the lowest elevation are these um, vertical lines and the vertical lines 
are very small here, but then they disappear altogether in, in our surveys here. So again, the, the best explanation for what's going on there is climate change and, and fairly dramatic impacts. As long as they have pl places to go, the species will continue to exist, but um, not doesn't, at least in the desert areas, it does not look like the Lanefields horned lizard is going to have the same luxury. I mentioned that we have these community scientists that uh, go out with me and help me. Um, these guys are invaluable, especially when we're looking for horned lizards. And horned lizards tend to, if you're, if you're just by yourself, they tend to freeze. But by the fourth or fifth person, they finally lose their nerve and they'll start moving. And so what we, we I keep pretty good records on who in line um, sees the most lizards. And this isn't me, but I'm always in the front of the line. I took this picture, so I, I'm standing off to the side here. But um, I record how many I see, and then I record how each other person sees, and, and it, not individual people, by, but by their position. So does the person, whoever that is right behind me, see how many do they see, and then the second person, and the third person. I, and I ask them to shift their positions all the time. So I'm not just getting somebody who's really good at finding lizards versus somebody who's less adept at finding them. What I find is that I see about half of the lizards. This person sees about 20% more ad additional lizards, and then it's like 10%, 5%. But y'all have to get back to about the sixth or seventh person before it becomes redundant that the last person isn't seeing anything new. Um, and I think this is something that we should all think about a little bit in terms of the, the kind of work we're doing, because one of all, we're getting better data when we have these people out there. But, and so that's critically important, but it's also, we're getting people excited about horn lizards and other lizards and, and getting them to understand the impacts of climate change. And so we're able to move those ideas beyond just the scientific community and get them out into the general public. So all of these people, um, Aren't, aren't scientists by trade that she's a realtor, she's a psychologist, um, she um, does stuff related to um, industrial um, design. Um, she's a dental a hygienist. He, he worked for the music industry. Um, these are not scientists, but they do a great job. Um, and so I, I just think this has been one of the interesting epiphanies that I've had along the way that you don't need to be have a PhD to go out there and do good science. It's good to have that PhD with you to help um, design the experiments and design the studies, but um, you don't need them there. And this is the Laneville horned lizards habitat at the higher elevations. This is pretty close to 5,000 feet elevation up in the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains. And, and this is one of the best areas that we found for the Blainfields. And the same thing is true when you get these volunteers together, you um, even the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth person, and we're basically hiking along trails. Um, you can imagine it would be almost impossible to move through this habitat if it wasn't for the trails. So anyway, that's the end of the talk. I'd be very happy to answer any questions or comments or criticisms. Um, and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I really appreciate you sharing uh, all of your hard work. Amazing. Um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat so far. If anyone else has any, you can enter them in there. You can raise your hand and we'll try to go in order a little bit here. Um, we may go over the one hour, but if anyone is willing to stay, you're welcome to. Um, so the first question we had was, um, is there a third desert that intersects in the desert of Southern California besides the Mojave and the Colorado? There, well, there actually, depending on how you slice the desert up, there's up to four of them. We do get a, a very small area of the Great Basin Desert and um, occasionally we'll find desert horned lizards in there. And there is a very thin strip along the Colorado River that has um, saguaro cactus. And so that's Sonoran Desert. So we get a little bit of the Sonoran Desert, a little, a little bit more of the um, Great Basin Desert. But the largest desert within California is the Mojave Desert. And then that's 
followed closely by the Colorado desert. Okay, yep, I, I agree. And, and within those, there's always kind of climate regions, almost different. Um, like you said, there's the duny areas, there's more um, vegetated areas, there's the desert pavement, that type of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so, and then Lynn was asking for you to repeat the, the line of citizen percentages based on where they're surveyed in line <laughs> that you right. mentioned there at the end. So generally speaking, I, I'm in when I'm collecting this kind of data and, and, and trying to ask the question of how many people do you need before you've um, really maxed out, you, you're seeing all the horned lizards or all the lizards in total that any you were going to see that day. I mean, there, I'm sure I, we know that there's a lot more out there, but they're either not in proximity to the trail or they're just in a burrow or they're not going to be seen. So I tend to... When I do the data, I tend to have somewhere between 50 or 60% of the observations that I see because I'm in the front of the line. The person who's immediately behind me, and it, and, and it doesn't matter who it is, but immediate behind me adds another 20% to that. So now we're up to about 70%. Um, then the next person adds about 15 or five, 10%, I'm sorry, 10%. And the next two or three are 10%. And, and once you get past position number six or seven, you really aren't adding anything more. But um, up until the fifth or sixth position, you, those each and every one of those people are adding observations that nobody else got to, would have seen if they if we had fewer people. Um, are there other ants besides the pogos that are important to the uh, Macaulay diet that you're observing? Um, there are a few areas where there, there's a the black um, harvester ant, which is Veromesser perganderi, um, but that the that particular ant tends to like more gravelly areas, and and so they don't really overlap with them that much. That, but where they do, they can certainly use them. Um, in their habitat, they're primarily eating the pogos. Um, there's a couple of species there, but the most common one is Californica. And they also will eat honeypot ants, which is Myrmecocystis is the genus. So they're, they'll eat those. But I would say 60 to 70, 80% of their diet are pogos and the rest are the other ants. And um, as other people have found out, um, Macaulay tends to have almost an exclusively ant diet. Other horned lizards will have mostly an ant diet, but it could range from 50 to 70 or 80 percent, depending on the species and the location. But Macaulay eye tends to be pretty restrictive. I've heard of some people say that they, oh, sometimes there'll be these um, sphinx moth caterpillars explosions, and that they said that they found um, the, the small instars of the um, sphinx moths in their diet. But that's a rel relatively small time of the year, and it usually only happens about once every two or three or four years. So it's really ants and mainly pogos are their, what they're eating. This is my question, actually, to add on to that is, um, are you seeing uh, a lot of invasive ants um, overtaking the native harvesters and affecting the horned lizards in the, in the areas that you're researching? or fire ants or Argentines, right. any of those with the golf courses and everything? <laughs> yeah, so what we found, um, and, and they found this on the coast too. So in, in coastal areas, and I, I can't tell you the exact distance, but the Argentine and fire ants will extend out. And I, the last number I heard was about 100 meters out from the um, man-made landscapes, either irrigated landscapes in one form or another, whether it's a household or a golf course or a farmland. Um, in the deserts, it's single digits. They, they don't extend more than about two or three, four, five meters away. It's just too dry for them. They, those invasive ants are very sensitive. So once you are in the native desert habitat and, and more than, let's say, four or five meters away from the, an irrigated area, we've never found any of the invasive ants. Yeah, we definitely have a big problem with them here on the coast. So um, definitely. That, that makes sense that they can't really survive once their water source is limited. Um, 
So the next question was, what role do you think the Colorado River Delta had in shaping flattail populations and how might that effect be different today? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, so the sandy areas, the bloat sand areas that are everywhere from the Salton Sea South, which is most, most of the extant habitat of the uh, flat-tailed horned lizards, were formed by sands coming down through the Colorado River. The Colorado River would flood every few decades, sometimes more often, sometimes less often. And those flood during a flood event, the river would jump out of its bank and flow into areas that are now the Mojave Desert or um, the lower part of the um, Colorado Desert. And so the sand dunes that we see today, to a large extent, are a result of the erosion of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. So all those pink and brown rocks that you see in the Grand Canyon are the sands that came down and now the Algodones dunes and, and many of the dune systems around the Salton Sea and further south down in the Grand Desierto. So the vast majority of their habitat is a direct result of flooding along the Colorado River. The only real strong exception of that is in the Coachella Valley. The Colorado River never flooded into the Coachella Valley itself. And so that we have a different sand source and, and a, a fairly unique sand source because it's eroded granite. Um, almost every other sand dune system you've ever seen is eroded sandstone uh, and moved around by a river. In the Coachella Valley, it's eroded granite. And so the, the sands are very pale, almost white in some cases, and have a lot of mica in, uh, in them, as well as um, some feldspar as well. But it's mostly quartz, mica, and some feldspar. So um, the Colorado River, as we all know, now has, um, I don't know how many dams it has, but it's never going to flood again. So there's never going to be a new source of sand coming into the system. Um, that said, the Grand Desierto down in um, northwest Sonora is a vast, huge um, sand field that would take centuries to blow away. Um, the Grand, uh, the Algodones dunes, similarly, although having all those off-road vehicles out there is speeding their movement away from the, the current habitat. Um, the real problem that we have in terms of managing their habitat in the Coachella Valley is because of all that fragmentation, there's no, it's very difficult to get new sand into the system. We are, it sounds sort of funny, but it, 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 right now it's the best we can do is we have the road department pick the sand up on the um, leeward side of the dunes where, where it crosses the roads. As soon as it hits the road, the road department picks it up and, and trucks it around and dumps it on the other end. So it, it's like a conveyor belt that we get the sand recycling through the system. But the question about whether, um, I, I think where the question might be leading is, is with the lack of flooding and the lack of new sand coming into the system, how does that impact the habitat for the flat-tailed horn lizard? And in the long term, it has an impact. It definitely does. Um, the, the sand is definitely moving from the Northwest to the Southeast. And, and it's gonna to continue to do that. And as it does that, it's exposing gravel and rocky areas that are no longer suitable habitat. And that's, we've seen that already for some habitats um, on the Northwest, Northeast side of the Salton Sea, where there were um, flat-tailed horned lizards. There may still be a couple, but there, most of that habitat is blown away. There's very little left. They do occur in some silty types habitat and, and they're uh, the folks that do surveys for them in the Ocotillo Wells area on the other side of the Salton Sea in, in Anza Borrego in Ocotillo Wells area, find them in that habitat, um, which is atypical compared to where most of them seem to occur, but they seem to be okay in there. They seem to be sustaining populations. Okay. Uh, I've seen them in that area and the, between the Ocotillo, between Ocotillo and El Centro, um, north of the eight, we did surveys in a plot over there and there we found desert and plateaus um, in the same habitat, but they were, there weren't a lot. 
there. Um, right. They were mostly focused on the south side of the eight freeway, which is a um, barrier for them, obviously. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, just to give you an idea in the, the habitat that I showed you, um, when the populations are high, um, it's at least 10 and up to 20 um, lizards per hectare, which is much, much higher than you find in that silty type habitat. Yeah, I think we found three over an entire like 6,000 acre parcel. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the next question was, will there be a link to the recording? And yes, there will be. This recording will be posted on our YouTube page. Um, and I, I think somebody can provide a link to that possibly. I don't have it, but um, there will be one and it will be available. Uh, you can probably search for it in our, on our YouTube page as well once we have it posted up. Um, the next question was, um, as the horn lizards move to higher ground, does the type of predators change? And if so, would it be for the better or the worse of the horn lizards? Um, well, I, that's another great question. The question that a lot of people have about this reorganization of all species as a result of climate change is that they will be interacting in novel ways with either um, diseases or predators or any number of things. And what does that mean? Even if they can move up slope, does that, do they end up getting eaten as soon as they get there? Um, so far, we have not seen that. Um, the main avian predators like kestrels and roadrunners and shrikes don't seem to be climbing the mountain with them, um, at least as, as much. I, I, I say that, and um, I was up at the top of the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway, which is a little over 8,000 feet a couple of years ago. And we found a road runner up there at 8,500 feet and it, nobody could believe it. And, and we were kidding that it somehow took a ride on the tram car because we couldn't figure out how else it could have gotten up there. So it could be that they are moving up um, and I just haven't noticed it. But um, certainly in as you get to higher elevations in areas with trees and shrubs, you're ending up with nesting sites for other birds. And so, as I'm, I'm sort of thinking as I'm talking here, but one of the um, predators, potential predators, and I think it's it's more than just potential, I think it's a real predator for them at the higher elevations are jays, especially scrub jays. And and I suspect that scrub jays take a lot of the blameville horn lizards, and, and you have, Cheryl, you've got more experience with that than I do, but um, I think the jays are becoming will probably be the, the more significant predator as they move up the hills. Kind of um, in connection with that, are, are you seeing a lot of predation by corvids in the desert, the ravens and the crows? I know it's been a big problem with the desert tortoises um, out there and that with all the irrigation and everything and the trash that there, there's a lot more ravens and crows coming in. Have they been predating um, horn lizards at all that you've observed? Um, ravens, yes. The crows in the desert tend to be restricted to urban areas. Um, I know they're not restricted in other areas, but so far for us, the crows are just around golf courses and people's yards. Um, the ravens, however, are super abundant and we see flocks of hundreds, if not thousands sometimes. And I have seen the ravens. <laughs> we walk these transects in the sand and, 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 um, looking for both fringe toed lizards and flat-tailed horned lizards. And if we don't get there first thing in the morning, we can see that the ravens are walking the exact same transect that we are. Um, so uh, I think the answer is yes, that they, they are. Um, they, the, the that was kind of the first thing I thought when you mentioned the radio transmitters up in that palm tree, I was thinking ravens, but kestrels, oh, yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah. So any other questions? Uh, just some interest in joining your citizen science group. I would actually be interested in that as well. Um, I'm sure we have several Southern California folks that would, or others that would even travel to go help out on some of those field efforts. Um, and we also have our um, annual horn lizard focused bio blitz that we're, um, I think 
still determining the date we're going to do that this year, um, where we invite people to survey in their backyards and areas to look for horned lizards and um, enter them into iNaturalist. So um, you'd mentioned that you've used some of their iNaturalist data points, um, and it's a really valuable tool. And so we're encouraging people um, all over the country, if you're finding horned lizards, to enter them in and uh, keep track of them for you know, sometimes they're used for scientific research often, so. Um, yeah, no, I agree 100%. I did want to shout out to one of the per, um, people who are listening in, Spider Fox, I can see her there, and she is one of our community scientists, and she has adopted um, a, one of the trails up in Joshua Tree that has the highest horned lizard density that we found anywhere. So she, a lot of our information comes from what she's found up there. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, did anyone else, Miranda has also mentioned that she's finding radio transmitters in trees in Oklahoma where she's at. So <laughs> it's apparently a common thing. Yeah, I, I saw her comment and I, I'm sorry to hear that, but um, um, I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Okay, well, um, if anyone else has any questions, um, speak now, that would be your turn. And if not, we'll conclude this presentation. Um, um, I believe our next monthly presentation will be featuring species from Nevada. Is that right, Mason? Still need to be confirmed, but hopefully. Okay. okay. And we're also still looking for other um, speakers for other that represent other states or regions and have horn lizard research. So if anyone is interested in volunteering and presenting like Dr. Barros did today, um, please let us know. You can uh, email us or reach us through our, uh, our uh, website. And um, Lynn, Lynn did post the, the link for this, uh, for our YouTube page. So if it's in the chat. I have a question. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm actually going to go, I'm on my way to teach class, so I'm going to mute myself as quick as I can, but I'm wondering if Dr. Burroughs has a recommendation for getting students started with modeling, if there's any kind of software program he recommends or um, any good introductory course that he knows of to get students just just getting their feet wet with modeling thank you um so the answer is um the, the modeling software is getting easier and easier to use um and um the folks that that are coming through um UC Riverside, the, the undergraduates coming through UC Riverside are taking specific classes on how to, how to model. And my only caveat to that is that I, I would really like to have students who model also be field biologists, because if you only do one and not the other, you're missing out on, on the, the larger picture. The modeling is incredibly valuable, but one way to think about those models is that they're hypotheses. Um, I often tell people all models are wrong. We just don't know how wrong they are or how right they are. And we have to be able to use real on the ground data to be able to validate those. And a lot of times I'll see students who never get in the field who are taking data from some other sources and, and publishing lots of papers and, and really important papers, but they don't really have the, that sort of firsthand knowledge to be able to say, you know, this model isn't really performing as well as it should because it's not picking up this area or that area of their habitat. Um, so that's my caveat to that is to, it's just a shout out to old farts like me that believe that field biology is really um, being overlooked these days and we need to continue to have us um, have that skill set out there. Um, the, but as I said, there are several different modeling programs out there. And, and if um, you're, I, all I see is that the letters N and D, so I don't know how to refer to you other, other than N and D. But if you email me, I can send you some information about some of the programs. Just email me and, and I'll be happy to send them to you. Could you please, uh, sorry, my, um, 
I, I registered really last minute and that's why I only put my initials. I was rushing. I didn't want to miss any of the call. Um, I'm a graduate student and an instructor um, at New Mexico State University where we have plenty of horn lizards around, but not in great numbers, but you know, many species in this area. Um, and I do some lizard population research. Um, it sounds like something that's really interesting too would be maybe using iNaturalist to get some predictions about, you know, the coming field season. I can't imagine not wanting to do the field bio, the field work. Isn't that the fun stuff? <laughs> it It is the fun stuff, but the, I just, the one um, modeling program that most people use is called Maxent. And so um, that would be the one that's the easiest one to use and the one that is most commonly used. I think there are some other ones that might work a little bit better, but Maxent is very good and very robust in many ways. So, um, but I agree with you. Um, the fun work is going out in the field. And if, and if all, you use as I naturalist records, then you're missing out on all the fun. As a field biologist, I concur. Um, <laughs> I also want to mention that I grew up in New Mexico near Silver City, and um, that's where I my love horn lizards started. So they're they're definitely out there, or at least they used to be. <laughs> so um, awesome, thank you. And oh, um, speaking, so of, speaking of which, I think you mentioned um, early in your talk that. The flat-tailed were the only ones with a dark stripe down them, a, a lateral, you know, um, I mean, a, what do you call it? A, 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 a dorsal. dorsal stripe? Yeah, right. and um, is it, wouldn't it, a, a Texas horn lizard has one as well. They have a light stripe. It's oh. not dark. Yeah. So I, I was, um, Interestingly, um, some people were speculating once um, when I was at a scientific meeting, and they said, you know, the light stripe of a Texas horn lizard mimics sort of the grasses that you would see in their habitat, and, and that makes sense. Um, and then, so then why do you get a dark stripe? And it actually, the, the person who was threw this out, um, at first I was saying, no, that can't be right, but F, now I'm watching it a lot and I think they might be right. The dark stripe looks like the shadow of a shrub um, on, on the sand. And so it actually works really well from that standpoint. So the, the dark stripes represent or mimic shadows and the light stripes mimic blades of grass. It looks like we had one more question come in. Um, you mentioned that many of the invasive ant species require piped in moisture. Um, I'm curious if you know about how adaptable the ants are to climate change. Are endemic ant species any more thermally tolerant than the invasive ones? Um, I'm not an ant expert, and I, I think um, the Horned Lizard Conservation Society needs to enlist some ant experts to really understand what's going on with these species. That said, I think ants do much what I was describing, I thought horn lizards were doing. They, they are very adaptable in terms of when they can go out and forage. Since they don't really depend on their eyes all that much, um, it doesn't matter if they come out or at night or during the daytime. And they're just following chemical trails and chemical clues for the most part. So to the extent that the ants can shift their behavior and, and their activity periods to stay within their thermal zones that they prefer. I think that they can adapt. I think that the um, invasive ants are largely from either tropical areas or at least near tropical areas down in Argentina and, and southern Brazil. And so to the extent that climate change is creating hyper arid conditions, I don't think those invasive ants are going to be able to evolve quickly enough to exploit those types of habitats, which is the saving grace for our desert horn lizards or our horn lizards overall. Yeah, that's my hope as well. Um, it's really bad here in the coastal area. Um, 
Okay, Does, if that's everybody, everybody had their questions. Oh, um, would you be willing to provide your email uh, contact information to, uh, I don't have hers. Can you provide yours, Andy? Um, so- I'll write the second, it wouldn't right. be. Okay. Yeah, okay. She, she's driving, it would be tough to do that. Um, <laughs> I have my um, email on the first slide of my presentation. So if, if Andy, if you can um, just get a copy of the presentation, it's there, it's it's easy enough. It's just my the first letter of my name, C, and then Barrows, my last name, um, all lowercase, at ucr.edu. Great. Easy. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much for that. And I think that will conclude our California presentation. So um, thank you again, Dr. Barrows, for joining us. And thank you, everybody else, and all your questions. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can um, reach out to the Horn Lizard Conservation Society. If you're not already members, please, please join um, and support our grant programs and our educational programs. And we'll be continuing our monthly, hopefully monthly um, presentations about different states where horn lizard conservation is occurring. Um, so stay tuned for more uh, announcements about our next talk and our upcoming talks. So thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening and your long weekend if you have one. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for showing up. <laughs>